God of creation, by your word and spirit, do a new creative work today. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. It's in the name of Jesus, the one who is the living word that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As Elizabeth introduced us to through the children's message, we are entering into a five-week sermon series, Flourish. This text from Proverbs 11:28 is the underlying principle guiding our series. A God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. And this morning we focus on our need to give. Our need to give. And so we hear God's word this morning from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, I want us to look at this text from Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 31, with the lens of generosity, the lens of God's generosity. And this morning, I want us to focus on uh, three corresponding pairs or couplets, image and likeness, relationship and responsibility, seeing and loving. We begin with image and likeness. Did you notice how our text begins this morning? Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them, image and likeness. For six and a half days, God has been making and creating and fashioning all that is seen and unseen. Uh, God separates light from darkness. Uh, God creates sea and sky. Uh, God creates uh, dry land and vegetation. God creates the sun, moon, and stars. And God creates the creeping things, fish and fowl, creeping things and cattle that move upon the earth. And by about noon on the sixth day, God, God has an idea. God says to God's self, let us make humankind in our image in our likeness and we see the generosity of God in deciding to create a unique species a species unlike any other living thing that God has created thus far a species unlike the plants a species unlike the creeping things that crawl upon the earth a species unlike the fish of the sea or the birds of the air God chooses to create a species in God's own image the Hebrew language here is interesting for the word for image is the word that literally means cut out. God chooses to create a cut out, a three dimensional object. In fact, this would be a familiar concept for the ancient people. 
This would be a familiar concept because uh, in ancient civilizations, when, when kings and queens would rule over their domains uh, and their territories would be vast and spacious, to remind their subjects of who the king and who the queen was, uh, the king or the queen would often place an image, a graven image, of that very king all throughout the kingdom to remind these people whom they are governed by. This is the very same image that we see in Genesis chapter 1. Let us make humankind in our image. And you notice, right? You notice the first person plural. A God who is creating within a divine council. A God who is surrounded by angelic beings. A God who is in dialogue. This creation is is a dialogical, it's a relational creation. In other words, the creation of male and female, the creation of humankind, is a creation that, that comes to us through communion. And notice that God creates in Genesis chapter 1, male and female together, that they might embody this communion. In other words, we are created in the image of God, stationed, at various places throughout the earth so that we might embody the image of a God, not who is dead, but a God who is alive. A God who is active. A God who moves about the world just as we move about the world. A God who speaks just as we speak. A God who breathes just as we breathe. A God who loves just as we love. God creates humankind in God's image and God's likeness. And God gives these human beings the capacity to enter into relationship with the world, with each other. That in embodying that God we serve and love, we might show all the world that we are witnesses of this one who has created us. This is a gift of God's Generosity, God gives of God's self to create humankind. I like how the theologian W. Sibley Towner, who is the Professor Emeritus of Biblical Interpretation at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, says it. He says, the Bible puts a great premium on human beings. We are not simply pieces of tissue or masses of electrons clinging to a speck of dirt that floats in the cosmic spaces. No, we are walking representations of God. Whatever image literally intends to say about God, it certainly means that the writer felt that human beings are of signal importance and exquisite value. The writer felt that human beings are of signal importance and exquisite value. Through the creation of humankind, through the creation of humankind, in God's image, in God's likeness, we see the generosity of God. But we also see God's generosity through relationship and responsibility in Genesis chapter 1. For the Bible continues, God blessed them. After creating humankind in God's image, male and female, God creates them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God blessed them and God spoke to them. This is the first time in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 that God actually speaks to God's creation. God creates the light and the dark. God creates the skies and the sea. God creates the sun, moon, and the stars. God creates fish and fowl, creeping things, cattle, things that move upon the earth. But this is the very first time that God enters into relationship with creation in a way that God addresses creation. And notice, God allows created beings, human beings, to address God back. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Don't you see how God is generous to human beings? How God's outlandish, extravagant generosity is poured out upon us. For God blesses human beings. 
God gives them power and procreation. God gives them the ability to fill the earth and to multiply. And God gives them the responsibility to subdue and have dominion over the earth. And this is probably where we need to take a pause. Because I don't know about you, but we human beings are infamous for twisting and distorting God's word to use it to our own likeness and our own purposes. When we think of subjection or subduing, or when we think of dominion or rule or power, we think of ourselves as as masters of our own domains. And we think that, that by, by, by these words, God is giving us a, a birthright, essentially, to lord ourselves over creation, to do with creation as we wish. But that's forgetting, of course, the previous point. That's forgetting, of course, that as human beings, we are created in God's image. We are created in God's image, which means that we are created to be nurturers of creation. We are created in God's image to be lovers of creation. We are created in God's image to be generous towards creation, to be caretakers of creation. To subdue the earth is to bring order to the earth, to join God in God's creative work, and to join God in God's, in God's extravagant generosity by bestowing the earth with loving care and kindness. God calls us to relationship. God enters into dialogue with human beings. And God calls us to take care of what God has entrusted to us. There is a responsibility here. Listen to what Terence Freedom says. He is the LLB level professor emeritus of Old Testament at Luther Seminary in St. Paul. He says, God serves as the supreme delegator of responsibility. When God conveys blessing, God gives power strength, and potentiality to the creatures. Such action, therefore, constitutes an integral part of the power-sharing image, a giving over of what, what is God's to others to use as they will. God's approach to creation was and continues to be communal and relational. God serves as the supreme delegator of responsibility. Walter Brueggemann the William Marcellus McFeeders, Professor Emeritus of Old Testament from Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, says, uh, borrows from Karl Barth. Brueggemann says, the creator is humanized as the one who cares in costly ways for the world. The creature is seen as the one who is entrusted with power and authority to rule. The text is revolutionary. It presents an inverted view of God, not as the one who reigns by fiat and remoteness, but as the one who governs by gracious self-giving. It also prevents an inverted view of humanness. This man and woman are not the chattel and servants of God, but the agents of God to whom much is given and from whom much is expected. God generously gives creation. God generously gives human beings. Being created in the image of God generously gives relationship and responsibility and God generously gives a seeing and loving near the end of our text did you catch how it ended for us this morning God saw everything that he had made not just human beings not just male and female God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day God saw everything God saw everything that God had made. God saw everything that God had made. Clarence Rimpel is a Mennonite leader in the Mennonite Church USA. He wrote an article several years ago talking about the way that creation is God's gift to us and that if we would just simply pay attention to creation for just a few short moments of every waking day, we would naturally become more generous people. Listen to what he writes. Do you imagine a God with a clenched hand or an open hand? Is the God you worship a giver or a taker? Well, the God of the Bible is a God of the open hand. Psalm 145, 16 says, God, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. 
God lavished beauty, complexity, and grandeur in creating the world. Consider flowers. Do you know that there are 600 varieties of asters and 25,000 varieties of orchids? Those are just two of 270,000 species of flowers. Why so many? What extravagance! What lavish, overwhelming beauty! God of the open hand has poured out his blessing in creation. I am overwhelmed by the grandeur of God's creation. A thousand stars in the sky would be plenty. I can only keep track of a half dozen or so by name, but we can actually see about 5,000 stars with the naked eye. Surely that would be enough. But no, our galaxy has 400 billion stars. And there are now 10 billion galaxies within reach of our most powerful telescopes. There are 70 sextillion stars, seven with 22 zeros behind it. To think of it another way, there are 10 times as many stars as all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches and in all the world's deserts. God of the open hand lavished complexity and majesty in the creation of the universe and the earth. Why such grandeur, such beauty, such intricacy in God's creation? God says, I made it for you to enjoy, to contemplate, to fire your imagination and to saturate your soul. God's generosity is evidenced in the extravagance of creation. We become what we honor and worship. As we behold God as extravagantly generous, our hearts will bloom with greater generosity. Our churches will become baskets of generosity and beacons of hope. We have been blessed to be a blessing. God's extravagant generosity poured out upon humankind as the crowning achievement of God's creation, humankind, the ones created in God's image, to enjoy, to see, to know, to, to learn, to discover the majesty and glory of God's creation. But notice also that our text refers not just to God seeing, but to God enjoying. And I would even say God loving. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. I imagine God smiling. I imagine God being filled with, with joy and God being filled with love for this great creation that God has made. And I imagine this to be the heart of, of, of really our need to give. The, this, this understanding of a God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. Our need to give, our need to join God is indeed a need to participate in God's great love for the world is revealed in creation. Barbara Brown Taylor, who teaches at Piedmont College, explores a variety of images for human beings in the creation narrative. She explores the notion of human beings as despots, as stewards, as priests, and she, she foregoes all of these metaphors and she settles on lovers. She says that human beings are called to be lovers of creation more than anything else. She writes, We are made in the image of the first lover, the divine one, who brought this whole shebang into being. If it is true that we have been put here to live in that image, then the only dominion we can possibly exercise is the dominion of love, without condition, without distinction, without self-interest or secret devotion to any other dominion, including the one in which the value of all things is reduced to their price. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, God's beloved taught. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In this economy, there is one sun in heaven that shines on everyone and everything. No matter what genus or species they are, no matter how much saliva they produce, no matter what they have done or left undone, they all get sun. In the same way, when the rain comes down, everyone and everything gets refreshed. Those who deserve it right along with those who do not. That is just the way God is with God's creatures. We are here because God made us. And if God made us, we live by love. Sure, some of us give God headaches. And others break God's heart. But we, we do not get to make distinctions. We are here to preside over the dominion of love. Made in the divine image, we are here to love as God loves. So move over. Make room. 
Because there is a whole creation seeking refuge. And you, you are the spitting image of the one who gives life to all. We are here to be the ones who preside over the dominion of love. That's really what this Flourish campaign is all about. It is about the dominion of love. As a freshman at Northwestern College, just over across the street, 1996, I sat in the Bogard Theater. Any of you remember the Bogard Theater in the RSC? This was back in the ancient days, some 20 years ago. And I sat in the Bogard Theater, and I'll never forget Dr. Jim Boltman standing before us as freshman incoming students and striking the fear of God in us. You are not here to play sports. You are not here to participate in music. You are not here to perform in plays. You are here to be students. You are here to be learners. And he challenged us, and he called us to be academics, focused on developing the life of the mind and the love of the mind. And near the end of his talk, he offered a challenge that has stood with me every day of my life since. And that challenge was this. You have come to Northwestern College, and by God's grace, you will leave in four years. I hope that you steward this time wisely, that Northwestern College is a better place when you leave than when you got here. That is what the Flourish campaign is all about. God has given us incredible gifts in this church. And out of God's great generosity to us, and in honoring the legacy of those who have gone before us and have made sacrifices for us, we join in God's generous call. You see, we have a need to give. And we have a need to give because ours is a God of love. And trust me, the city of Orange City and the larger region of Sioux County is in desperate need of the kind of love God chooses to shower upon all. Oh, may it be said of us, my dear friends, oh, may it be said of us that we are ones who, who rule over the dominion of love, who live in light of the God who causes God's sun to shine on the good and the evil, on the evil and on the good, and causes rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Oh, may we model the generosity of a God who's given us so much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your goodness to us, your generosity to us, for the way that you have created us in your image to embody your goodness and grace to all the world. God, may we be the ones who live in and among and under the dominion of love. And may this congregation, American Reformed Church, be the kind of place that is lavish and extravagant and the generosity of love to all. It's in the name of Jesus, the one who most fully embodies your image, that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.